You can put this on film while I get tossed. I've got another drink. So we need to watch swearing and people slash companies. That's tricky, isn't it? Yeah. I don't think I swear that often, do I? <laughs> you know what that is? The f***ing trees. Yeah, it's, it's happening. Because the wind's really picking up out there. I know. Okay, should we get going? <laughs> Yeah, go on. If you want the honest truth of it is that um, it goes back to when I was a kid. There's a couple of episodes I can recall that um, I was at this sort of rather, not wouldn't say posh, but certainly above my league. I, and my sister, she was a lot older than me, she was married and she had a couple of children and it was her eldest daughter's something like her sixth birthday or something. We went to, you know, so there was a part, a birthday party. And my, they decided to have a drawing contest. And I remember really relishing it. I was seven. Really relishing that and draw it. And, and I won it. And I knew I'd win it. I knew I was good, even then. And then, um, and then one, I don't know when it, it was, when was a big winter? Was that 62? It must have been then. So I'm 10, 10 or 11. And we're going, I don't know where we're going, but it's night time. There's a, we're walking up the Richmond Road in Twickenham. And I'm with a friend of the family, a guy, a lovely guy called Jack Richards. And he asked me that question. You know, he said, what do you want to do when you grow up, David? You know, when you're older, what do you want to be? And I said, straight away, I said, commercial artist. And he said, ooh, that's a tough world to get into. He said, whoa, you know, he said, that's really true. And he, and he knew someone that was a cartoonist or an illustrator, and sort of saying how tough it was, you know, to break through and, and to please the, the clients, you know, that sort of thing. And um, I didn't know what commercial meant. I knew in my family that if you said you were going to be an artist, they're like, what? You, you know, you don't. People like you don't become artists, you know. And I, I heard this word commercial artist, and it just sounded nice. So I just said, I want to be a commercial artist. So I was 10 or 11. We lived in a, you know, it's fairly sort of, um, oh, it's a lovely area now. Uh, we, my mum and dad rented a little terrace cottage, um, you know, outside toilet, that sort of thing. Um, it's funny because, I think, you know, like, I would have been in my fifth year at school. And um, so I'm 15, 16. And um, the, the school, one of the head of art, so, well, art oh, was a joke, but this teacher said, he pointed to two of us, you and a guy called John Bryant. He said, you and Bryant, he said, uh, get some work together, what you've done in art, and take it to Twickenham College of Technology, which was a local college. They want to see the standard of work we're doing here, you know. So me and John, yeah, we went together, had these folders, and I didn't. I just went to the college thinking, you know, we were just shown our work. I didn't realise it actually turned out to be an interview for a place on the foundation course for the next year. And uh, I was interviewed by this giant of a man called Osmond Kane, who was a painter, and I found out subsequently he was a painter and artist. But he was like, he looks like he stepped out of the Victorian age. He looked like Charles Darwin. He had a massive beard, bald head, big bow tie. He was about six foot. He was like a giant. And he, he sort of looked at my work and and so sort of, And then during the, the course of him looking at work, I realised that it, it, this was an interview. And... Um, and of course, my parents got a letter, you know, saying they'd offered me a place. Well, they were lining me up to do an apprenticeship as a printer because, you know, I only did a handful of O-levels. And um, I got this place at college and, uh, yeah, it was, 
And so as my mother said later on, you've never been the same since you started that art college. But she was proud as well because there was a point you know, at the end of the year at school, you know, they had the parent teachers evening or whatever. Uh, and it was the end, and like, and there was an exhibition of my work like, along other with other students of our artwork because we'd done it CSE in those days and GCE. And uh, apparently, the report come back from my mother when they returned, you know, the next morning. I didn't go. Um, your teacher, Mrs. Biondi, come running to us. Oh, your son, he's brilliant. You know, like I'm raving about my work, apparently. So you could tell she was quite proud, you know. And then when she died uh, years later, I was, you know, I got a, an old scrapbook of hers that she never stuck anything in. She just used to tear out sheets of newspapers and, you know, just put them in, never stuck them down. And of course, there's some, amongst it, there was some, you know, half a dozen David Hughes reproductions from the Daily Express uh, from the 70s in there. It's quite, so that was quite a nice thing to see, you know. So, yeah, although she was dead set against the sc- and I think my dad was as well. He didn't really want me to go to art school. But, you know. No, I don't, I suppose. Um, I don't know. I mean, I just... I think it's probably in the trait of it. If you're uh, anything artistic, I think you tend to be that way inclined, that you question people and authority. So I think it's just part of the ammunition of being an art well you know, I am calling myself an artist um, but it being a, you know whatever I do you know and yeah subvert I like to subvert I like to provoke as well I mean there is that element of mischief I think I'm more mischievous I like to push people sometimes and see what the reaction is and yeah it's not a good idea to be like that all the time because as I subsequently found out during my career I've obviously upset people without realising and it hasn't done me much cop really to be honest but yeah um but there is a story when i was a postman um <laughs> i was a i used to work at this little um sub sorting office post office over at hampton very nice area so it's got very small so it's about 24 postmen and every six weeks they'll send over a new from the main office we'd have a different inspector to run the shop and there was this little guy came over. I'd never met him before. Probably ex-army, probably. Little bald guy. And in those days, I don't know if this is boring, but in these days, you, you had recorded letters. And as a postman, you were expected to, like, get a signature when you delivered. But also, you if they were out the first time, you'd have to try to deliver again the second time and the third time before leaving a docket. And, and you had this little book. And, and I'd made a comment probably some like you know because i had failed to deliver this particular troublesome package and i'd written something in there like it was not your normal thing to write i can't remember i have no idea what it was i was reminded of this story years later by a friend that i met at the post office anyway so i'd done this and this inspector called me out and he barked i mean i can only say he barked at me and he was having a right old go at me and uh uh, I think I was reacting to him in being cheeky or whatever. I was 24, you know, and uh, it's just the 70s, you know, and uh, I was being quite rude back to him and he couldn't, he, he found he's frothing at the mouth and and also he had a go at what I was wearing because I wasn't wearing a tie, I was scruffy and he told me to smarten up and I, and then he, and then when I was going back at him, he went, button it, button it. <laughs> just repeated button it I just started laughing I couldn't believe this little squirt of a man was telling me to button it <laughs> that's so funny anyway I'd forgotten this but this friend of mine reminded me he said do you remember David that next morning when you came back into the office the next morning how you were dressed thought, oh yeah and what happened was I, I, I put on my loudest cabaret style crooner shirt it was I think it was purpley wine colour with frills down the front and I wore this huge bow tie and under my uniform and um, yeah he never said a thing to me that was my way of reacting so I mean so yeah I'd, authority yeah I mean it's just you got to question things haven't you really I think you yeah yeah you got to question stuff I mean I can be a good boy as well you know I, you know, I can behave myself
What happened was, I remember reading an article in the Association of Illustrators magazine, and there was this article about this re relatively new publishing house, this new uh, specialising in children's books called Walker Books, and talking about the founder Sebastian Walker and art director Amelia Edwards, and he was establishing a a reputation for good illustration, good use of illustration. So I, in those days I was living up near Manchester and so I, I spent a week in London making, I made some appointments. So this is the late 80s, you're talking probably 87. And I took my folder, it was like Walker Books was the last place I went to that visit. And I remember going in with a portfolio and I saw this woman, I didn't, and she was a designer called Liz Wood. And she started going, leafing through the folder. And she was talking to me as if I was a student, as if I'd just left college. And then she started seeing some of my work. And, oh, and she started apologising because she realised that I'd obviously had stuff published. And there was a, a spread in the folder, uh, a print in a mag from a magazine uh, on Bob Hoskins and Michael Caine, who'd been together in a film, I can't remember what the name of the film was, and it was a review or something, and I'd illustrated. Yeah, and, oh, she said, there's someone here who absolutely loves Bob Hoskins. Hang on a minute. And she, and she ran, runs off and brings out this other woman, this American, who subsequently bought this the original of this drawing. Her name was Amelia Edwards, and um, Amelia was this co-founder of Walker Books. And she's a great designer, very sympathetic designer, typographer, artist, and a real New Yorker. And um, she, uh, on all that meeting, she said, I'll send you a script, I'll find something for you. And I went, wow, you know. And quite several months passed, and then one day the script came through the letterbox. And subsequently I, um, illustrated a book by the writer Jan Mark, a picture book called Stratton Chateau, which featured a cat, a rat, and various cockroaches and insects and frogs and all sorts of things. And uh, so a sort of morality tale. And um, yeah, Walker, in those days, I don't know if it's still it publishers do it anymore. I doubt it. They very generously gave me a development fee, and I was able to. So they wanted like the characters, the main characters, which was the cat and the rat, Stratton Chanto. And in those days, I was doing um, large pencil and charcoal pieces, and uh, I did this these two studies of the two characters in pencil and charcoal, and, and color as well, and watercolor. And uh, Amelia's reaction was, they're wonderful, they're beautiful. And then she had to show them to the writer and other people. And then the feedback was, David, they're, they're too sophisticated. Can you... And I remember being... That's right, I was in the office and at Walker Books and to have a meeting with them afterwards, this feedback. And because uh, uh, Amelia was still like, I want you to do this, which was great. And... I'm sitting, and that's right, Amelia left the office, and I'm looking around the walls, and there's various examples of illustrators' work that have been doing stuff for Walker, like Colin McNaughton and Patrick Benson, if I remember rightly. Probably not send, um, anyway, there was quite, and everything was in pen and ink and watercolour. Everything seemed to be in pen and ink. And when Amelia came back, I said, okay, I said, I suppose you want me to draw in pen and ink and do cross hatching, do you? She said, well, yeah, maybe. And so that's what happened. And I spent nine months on Stratton Chateau. I mean, I was doing other things as well. I was doing editorial work, doing lecturing. So I didn't spend my whole nine months. But it was a very disciplined work. And you would have... In, are you, I, was, I was trying to make my work look spontaneous, but in reality it wasn't. It was like literally drawing it, redrawing it, then putting it on a light box and putting paper over and following a line and, and, and making it look spontaneous and fitting, you know, I had to work within the structure of the grids, etc. 
So it was a real disciplined piece of work. And then we got to, I hadn't done the end papers. And the end papers didn't really need any characters in. It was a land, and I just sort of, in my head, I always remembered the early Noddy books, where they had the end papers would be a, a, a vista of, was it Toyland, Toy, Toy Town, you know, with a viaduct, I think, and a, a town on a train and all that sort of thing. And I, I remember as a kid, look, I used to study it, you know, it was great. And uh, so I thought, yeah, I'll just do the environment that these characters inhabit. And of course, it was, you know, during, in the text, it was uh, fire escapes and derelict buildings and buildings being demolished. And I'd been to New York, I think, at that point. I can't remember. But New York was definitely in my influence. And where I'd, where I'd moved to, like, you know, coming out from the south of England, I was living on the outskirts of Stockport, the Peak District, half an hour from Manchester. And the centre of Manchester was full of like magnificent old buildings still. That were, at that point, hadn't been gentrified or anything. And there were fire escapes. And, and the same with Stockport, a lot of fire escapes around and industrial cotton mill type buildings and things. And we'd moved into a, in 1987, we'd moved into this large semi-detached Victorian house which had been flats and needed a lot of work doing on it. And, and they had these magnificent chimney pots that were like castles. And so all that stuff was in my head. So I had this blank sheet of paper, pen, ink bottle, paper, dipped my pen in, and I started there. I hadn't worked anything out, it was just in my head, and I drew. And I drew, and about an hour and a half later, I had a finished piece of work. I thought, wow, that's what I should be doing. That's the way to do it. And for me, that was the best drawing in the book. And um, anyway, the artwork was sent off. And literally, I know it's days later, I had a phone call. And Pentagram it was, uh, you know, very, very uh, good design group. This guy rang us up. And he, he said, it's, I don't know where he'd seen my work. He hadn't seen the pen and ink stuff. He'd just seen my pencil and collage. And they had this book called Archie and Mahitable, which was published by Faber. And that's who it was for. It was Faber and Faber. And he sent, he said to me, he said, um, it's a book, it's written by a journalist. And I think it was the 30s. There's these series of pieces of prose that he put together. And they would appear in, the, I think, the New York Times. And it was like done through the eyes of a cat living with a cockroach. And the cockroach would be typing out the cat's thoughts. And so basically it was a whimsical, slightly satirical view of the world through, you know, written by this art, this writer through the eyes of these characters. And I said, a cat and a cockroach. I said, I don't believe this. I said, I've been drawing cats and cockroaches the last nine months. It was really weird. So he sent me the book. It was wonderful. Lovely book. And like everything, I leave everything to the last minute. I read it, but I hadn't done any drawings. And there was a deadline for some roughs. And the day before the deadline, I was, I was in Birmingham. I had a, a long day in Birmingham. It involved alcohol as well. And I didn't get back home until gone midnight. And next day was the deadline for the roughs for a meeting. And I hadn't done anything. So I went to bed, gone past midnight, probably one o'clock in the morning, went to bed. Thinking, you know, I've got that job to do in the morning. Shit. And uh, I got up, I don't know, four or five o'clock. This is where my training as a postman came in, Andy. I got in, I got up about four or five o'clock in the morning, went in the studio. And I just started drawing pen and ink and um, did, I did about three or four different drawings. But one of them, I sort of indulged myself. I became totally self indulgent. And uh, did this cat looking out of a window at a, a sort of cityscape that was loosely like New York, could be Chicago, but it was like just out of my head, no reference, nothing, just drawing, just almost doodling. And in those days, of course, there was no emails or anything. You, you had to pack the artwork up and get it onto the railway track at Stockport Railway Station. 
and then that would arrive, you hoped, at Euston, and you would hope that they would send someone to collect it. So that's what you did. You know, you drove like a maniac to, the, to try and get the train in time, which I did, and then got on the train. And, of course, you wait to hear as the parcel arrived, and I never heard anything for three weeks. I didn't like to phone up. I was too nervous to phone up, thinking, oh, they've obviously rejected it. So eventually, three weeks later, I did ring up, and I said, oh, hello. I can't remember the art director or the art designer's name. I said, I guess you've rejected my, my drawings. I said, uh, how much do I, you know? He said, no, David, we love it. It's at the printers. It's going ahead. And um, so, you know, I got well paid for a couple of hours' work. That's probably one of the first few jobs that I'd say I was ahead of the game, you know. And that's... And then shortly after that, I got a, a job for Creative Review magazine, which was quite a big magazine in those days in the design fraternity. And I, I said, can I do it in pen and ink to them? Because, again, they, were, they only see my pencil and charcoal. I said, David, do whatever you feel like doing, you know. And when it was published, it was on their cover. And so, really, it was those two jobs that sort of kick-started me 15 years after I left college. But it was also through the discipline of working on a children's book, Straight and Chateau. So there's the, it was that combination, really. I always try to be honest. It's just about honesty, I think. You know, that's what makes me, yeah, I can't, I can't bullshit. I'm very bad at bullshitting. And um, I can bullshit about myself, like show off like I'm brilliant or something, a genius, and like I'm not really mean it. You know, I can spout, but I'm not really, uh, I really... Like, I'm honest. And I think the drawing is like handwriting. You know, you okay, you have a million influences, you know, whether it be photographers, art, fine artists, illustrators. And, you know, you look at that stuff and then... But you have to find your own way. It's no good trying to imitate. It's no good. You have to find your own way. And um, I liken my illustration to my handwriting. You know, like, try... It, it has to be honest. And yes, I can, you know, people say, oh, you're channeling whoever, you know, am I? Am I channeling that particular artist? Am I channeling Picasso? Am I channeling George Gross? Am I, you know, or David Hockney? You know, yeah, I love those artists, but I don't really sort of, you know, actually think, oh, I'm going to do Picasso today, or I'm going to do, you know, it's in you. And, um, yeah, and that's what, it's just being honest, really. And uh, pen and ink... I mean, it's not my first love, pen and ink. Um, pencil has always been the, the, the most simplest tool, and I love it. But pen and ink, yeah, because when you have pen and ink, you have that blank sheet of paper, and that blank sheet of paper's going, go on then, do your worst, do your worst, screw me up. You know, it's like you have an expensive piece of watercolour paper. That is so... Uh, watercolour paper. And that is so intimidating. It sounds pathetic, but it is, isn't it? You know, that white sheet is like, go on then. <laughs> and you're like, you're so precious. You're like... <laughs> so, but if you, you know, but pen and ink, you put a bloody mark down, it's down. You can't rub it out. And it's like, you know, you, you it, it, that's what's honest is a dip pen, not just a, not a fountain pen, but a dip pen where you have to physically stick your pen in a bottle of ink and bring it out. And then suddenly, bop, and then you start drawing, you know. And then, I, I mean, when I look at some of the drawings in the 90s that I did in magazines, I can see, you know, I think, how did I, it, they're lunatics sometimes because there is discipline there, but there's also a point where I can tell the drawing's going wrong. It's not how... I visualised it, and so I'm, I'm at, and they they printed these drawings. I'll be scroll. There's, there's areas of it, or I've actually <laughs> scratched it out, but continued, and of course that releases me. You can't get any worse, and that's it. I realised that you, you scrub a drawing out, but stick with it, and if you stick with it, suddenly something happens and it grows. <laughs> I hate that word organic, but it spreads and so and you relax and it works because you think it can't get any worse. It's going to get better. It can only get better from now. And uh, I think that's with all drawing. That's what it is. It's, it, and yeah, obviously, obviously, there are lots of works that I've done that 
There are more than one version of it. And I've kidded myself. I've self-deluded that I think I'm such a brilliant genius. I, I do it straight off all the time. I don't, you know, but there are drawings that have been straight off without any prior drawing whatsoever. But there are a lot of drawings that look are spontaneous, but there's been other versions prior to it. And you have to lift yourself. You have to go up another gear and think, this is your cup final. You know, you have to... Well, that's personally for me. You have to raise your game. Literally, that cliche. But you have to raise your game to really produce goods. And of course, it's all to do with whatever the commission is and perhaps who you're working for and where it's going to be reproduced. All those sort of things come into play and the prestige of a certain job and or perceived prestige of a job. Yeah, I like to be honest. In the old days, before the internet, I used to tear out all these magazine pictures from the Sunday Times or the Observer or any magazine and build bo I had boxes of reference, you know, of famous people because I'll often be asked to draw a caricature or whatever. And, you know, and so you get a job to draw someone and you, you spend a, two days going through thinking that you're working and you're just looking <laughs> bloody magazine pictures of whatever and you get distracted and then you go and make a coffee you go and hoover or whatever you have an affair with someone no that's a joke <laughs> you have um you do anything you know go out for a walk you know whatever you do anything to avoid starting and though there'd be deadlines and, and then you, and then you get sick to the pit of your stomach <laughs> And then you sort of start trying to do something and it'd be awful. And then, yeah, I'd either work for the night or you know, get up early. And the only thing is, you, there's an internal thing in you that must know how long it will take you. And you leave it to that final, where it's almost the door's closing and you're going to get your fingers caught in the door. Um, there's something intuitive that gets you through it. Yeah, sometimes, there's been a couple of occasions where it hasn't quite worked like that, but generally speaking, yeah, creative block. You can't afford to have a creative block when you're freelancing. Probably The Observer, I suppose. Uh, the one that really sort of got me known as a body of work. I mean, nearly three years, doing a weekly drawing gives you um, confidence to fail because you know if one drawing one week is not one of your best for whatever reason you think oh, I've got to beat that next week and I think I did some of my best work now it was between 1990 and the end of 92 I was devastated actually when that, they dropped me from that it was the, the Observer and it was the, um, they were redesigned. And they, well, how I got it was, um, I'd been, I had done work for the Observer newspaper in the past, but it was mainly the big char. I was doing uh, charcoal, big portraits for the literary page, literary review pages. Of, I did portraits of um, Hitchcock, um, Seamus Heaney, Doris Lessing. Uh, various people, writers or whatever, it'd be biographies or whatever, and they would be quite um, as if I tried to draw them as if they were sat in front of me. I did big charcoal with torn paper collar, very designy, big pieces. Anyway, I had an exhibition in in London in '89 at a small gallery, the Association of Illustrators Gallery, and the Observer art editor bought along. Dave, a guy called Dave Ashmore, he brought along one of his colleagues, Graham Michener, who was the edit, art editor of the magazine, and he'd been to that exhibition, and he got in touch with me afterwards and said, we're redesigning the magazine, David, we're doing a medical column, there's a medical column on the back page, we're going to use a rotor of different illustrators, but we'd like you to kick it off, would you be interested? Well, yeah, that sounds great, yeah. money was rubbish. 
And so for six weeks, I was going to be the first illustrator. And when my first drawing appeared, I mean, I was working in those days, I was working bloody enormous, ridiculous, really. About the size of this desktop. <laughs> and, the, and then the drawing appeared, and it's like, <laughs> you need a magnifying glass to look at it. And the reproduction was bloody awful. I'm like, oh my God, oh, this is shit. And it, it struggled on, I limped on, and I thought, oh, I'll do me six weeks and that'll be it, you know. And about the fourth week, I was getting really despondent by it, you know, it's so small, my drawing was appearing. And then, I, unusually, I got this postcard from the writer of the pieces, a guy called John Colley. And he was like, he'd sent, and what was nice about the postcard, it was a, a reproduction of a Goya painting, so that appealed to me. Anyway, he wrote, oh, I love your work, David. I hope you continue to do it. Because his writing, he was a medical man. He was a doctor. And his writing was sort of political. It was sometimes satirical. But it always had a point, serious point. And sometimes it'd be fairly comical. And so, it, obviously, we suited each other. And then um, the same day, that Graham Mitchell, the artist, who phoned me up. He said, David, he said... Um, we're going to use this week's drawings going to be to have a bigger space. We're going to give you more space. He said, we've decided also, would you like to carry on doing it for however long it runs? I went, wow, yeah. And so that following week, it ran across like the whole four columns across the top of the article. And um, and I really started motoring then and um, did some great work. I like to draw writers, funny enough. So, um, yeah, politicians, I don't, I've never really been a fan of drawing politicians. I always, my heart would sink if I was asked to do a, um, a politician, but I always did. I mean, I just can't stand drawing politicians. And, um, cause I'm not, a, you know, I'm not a vicious artist, I don't think. I'm, I, I may be, you know, a bit dark sometimes and all that, but when it comes to politicians, uh, yeah, I just have no time for most of them. Um, and I don't particularly want to draw them. Um, but because people put you in that bag, because you draw in pen and ink, you get like lumped in with other, you know, political illustrators, cartoonists. And I think I've, I'm a wider range. And uh, But it's interesting because the pandemic turned me into more of a political. I've, I've never drawn so many politicians in my life as I did in those two years of lockdown. And I hated them all. Oh, assholes. <laughs> and I, and I, I, you know, for me, it was always, and it's always trying to get a likeness as well, you know. And I hate, but I hate drawing, you know, like you see so many cartoonist characters that draw people with big noses or you know, whatever, and I'm like, no, it's not that simple, you know, because the crux of it for me is is drawing and um, being honest, and I got fed up exaggerating features. It's hard, actually, to do it well. It's really difficult. It takes a lot out of you. It did out on me, anyway. But, yeah, policy, I can't remember. <laughs> or do I like people? Do I draw? Do I prefer drawing people I like? Yeah, I guess. I, I mean, I like drawing people from life. But I get intimidated by people. If uh, and it takes me, I mean, if I don't get it right straight away from life, I get really disheartened. I have to really force myself to continue. And I just wish people could. Sometimes if I get them in the studio, I've had people pose for me, and I say well, it's going to last an hour and a half, you know. And sometimes it does, and sometimes they're. I'm really happy. And then, and they're usually people, I went for a period of just getting back into drawing from life, which was, I hadn't done for a long time. And I just grabbed, I, like na our neighbor, I, a bloke that did some gardening work here, I drew him, I drew friends, family. And um, there were people I, some people I didn't have too much opinion about, but most of them I liked, you know. There are times when I love it and times when I hate it. Yeah, times when I'm like terrible in my own company. Um, but yeah, I guess 
That's why the pandemic was... Pr- I didn't mind it at all, because it was just like almost like normal life, and I'm very fortunate where I live in as far as the pandemic was concerned. But, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I have worked in environments where, you know, I'm working with other people. But, um, yeah, there has... Sometimes there comes that time when you have to be on your own, I think, to really get down to the nitty-gritty of it and focus on what you're doing. But um, at the same time, you can be in the environment where there are other people, you know, a working environment with other people, and that also can have a positive effect on you because you have to do it, you know. You can't sort of be precious. you just got to get on with it and do the job, and um, that's also equally good. But, yeah, I'm happy. Yeah, I suppose in general... I'm I'm obviously okay with my own company, yeah. Long time, long time, especially if I'm, I mean, it's a great way to spend time, isn't it, is to, you know, indulge in a sketchbook or, 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 or you know, a diary, or not a diary, I mean, I suppose it is a diary, but you're writing and drawing. That's a, a I suppose it's almost a privilege, but, um, and you think, why isn't everyone realised this is a great way of spending time that's boring, you know, it's to draw and write. And, you know, like when you're, you've got no dentist appointment or a doctor's appointment or whatever, you know, you wait, you've missed a train, you've got an hour to kill. You know, yeah, all right, you can do a crossword, you can do Sudoku, but it's great to sometimes, you know, it's almost smugness <laughs> you can draw. And no one else, everyone's bored, shit, and getting angry because there's trains late or whatever, and you're drawing. And the time goes like that. That's a very great position to, you know, we're very lucky to realise. If, mind you, I don't do it much these days. <laughs> Quite out of practice, you've got to keep practising. I'll get back into it at some point, but, um, yeah. I'd like to write, I'd like to do another book, but I really, uh, I did the pill box back in 2015 and it's like, Christ, it's nearly 10 years ago and I haven't done a book since. And I still think I've got a book in me. <laughs> and I did start trying to do a, a sort of more optimistic, because it's quite a bleak book, pill box, really. God knows where it came from. But um, I'd like to develop, I wanted to develop what the, the, the character, the central character and turn it into something else and um i i have stopped and started over the last sort of three or four years there are i i suddenly sometimes come across little sequences that i've done and i think i must do something with that and i haven't done it there's that i would like you know my little friend here i like i like mucking about with sculpture you know and yet i'm i technically i'm in net when it comes to putting materials together but I suppose they're they're more sort of three dimensional collage, really, aren't they? And um, I do like that's what I really enjoy is is making these things. I don't do it enough, and um, and it's funny because again, I, I thought I realised going all the way back to when I was fifteen, sixteen in my CSEs, I. I made some awful sculptures out of old rusty bed springs that I found in the allotment with ping pong balls. <laughs> I mean, I got that and I painted, I remember painting them. And I, and I think, and I won a prize that year because I, I think I had a 100% pass rate or something in my, my six CSEs, my three O levels. And I got a prize and they said, what would you like? And I asked for a book of modern sculpture. And I was 16. And I've still got that book. And I'm like, there, it's obviously always been in me, this idea of making things in a three-dimensional sense. It's quite... And I think it's aligned with drawing. So that's something I'd like to do more. I'd love the chance of some rich person that sponsor me to do something in bronze. <laughs> you know, with this sort of... My IKEA version of sculpture, you know, flat pack kits of sculpture with things stuck on them. That's what I'd like to do. It's funny because people, are like, you know, you get lumped in with illustrators, and I've never really, they were never really my, you know, there is, there is a scrapbook somewhere of mine where I've, I've kept. 
illustrators of the day back in the 70s and there were some great people but I can't say they're really they were really my inspiration it's always been the artists it's always been Peter Blake um to lose the trick, you know, the obvious one. Even in the early days, probably Aubrey Beardsley, although he was like poo-pooed in, in a way, but his line, you know, amazing. Not that I was inspired by it, but it is incredible. And, um, yeah, Peter Blake was... Because I'd never heard of watercolours until I saw Peter Blake's work. Um, and I was, you know, I was about 16 before I saw Peter Blake. And then I was at the Whitechapel... And David Hockney had an exhibition at the Whitechapel in 69, I think that was. So I'd have been set, and I saw his work, and I was, like, amazed by it. Uh, I mean, and then, of course, the real revelation to me was Egon Schiele. When I was, sorry, it was, he was part of an exhibition at the Royal Academy, probably about 1969, 1970, where a particular tutor, uh, Malvina Cheek, took us to, and I was blown away by it. Egon Sheila. And I remember going to a gallery once when I was a postman one afternoon. Some little gallery in, sort of up in London, in St. James's somewhere. And I was the only one in there. And it was Egon Sheila's drawings, the originals. There was no one in there. I, I felt like I'd steal one. And I was like, wow, this is like late 70s. And then I went to the Egon Sheila exhibition few about four or five years ago was it the royal academy and you couldn't move for the people it was awful bloody awful and yet i saw his exhibition that afternoon to myself it was amazing and then i saw his paintings um which i was never a fan of until i went i got invited to um vienna on the back of walking the dog back in 2010, 2011, and went round one of the museums there, and because these paintings were there, boy, magnificent. And he died at 28, you know, it's like, Christ. So I'm in the, you know, you never get as good as that, you know, and you think, why are you doing this? Why do you still do it? Because you're not that good. There's millions of you out there that are good, you know. You're just another illustrator. As the guy from New York said in the Italian gallery to me, he was being shown round, you know, they're going to rep my work. And he said, of course, he said, you're just a cartoonist. It appears in newspapers. Oh, yeah. It's not bad. <laughs> Be a cartoonist in a newspaper, is it? Blimey. <laughs> That's a great question. Do I like my work? If I'm really honest, I think sometimes, yeah, I do like what I've done, but you always find something, you know, oh, that's, that's not what, that bit's, that bit's, that bit's not very good. Or, or. Often I, I cringe, but there are certain pieces I think, that's bloody good, that, beat that. But yeah, um, do I like my work? Do you know what? I remember drawing, um, it was late at night and I was working for the Times magazine and it was, um, you asked earlier, um, do, do you prefer drawing people you like or don't like? And I was drawing someone I liked. It was Eric Cantona, the Manchester United footballer. There was a profile on him for the Times magazine. It's going to be a full page. So that alone, a full page, is going to inspire me to really try. I've got to do something good. And it was Eric Cantona as well, for God's sake, you know. And it was late at night. and um, Well, not late, but it was at night. It was probably similar. I, and I had a big sheet, you know, I had quite a big sheet of cancer, this Canton paper that I use. And it was, it was first go. I thought, because he played for Manchester United, I thought, and they play in red and white. I've used red ink. And red ink is horrible to draw with because red ink is the sort of ink you will spill. It's one of those inks, wrecked it's red. Anyway, so I'm drawing with red ink and I've drawn this face, his portrait out in ink straight away. You know. And my daughter at the time comes in to say goodnight to me. She's ready for bed. 
and I don't know, was she eight, nine years of age at the time? And I'm, uh, I, you know, good night, daddy, you know, I, 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 so, you know, so I stop and say my good And she looks at the drawing, and I'm thinking, oh, this is shit. This is shit. She says, wow, that's good. And she goes off to bed. <laughs> it made me look at it again. And I thought, yeah, she's right. He's good, isn't it? <laughs> And so next morning, I got up and finished it, and um, it appeared full page. And if it hadn't been for my daughter telling me it's good, I probably would have, would have might have even torn it up and started again. But I continued with that piece of work because one bit of enth uh, encouragement from my young daughter. And it shows you how um, tragic I am, how I need that. You know, you need someone to pat you on the back and say, that's good, you're all right. <laughs> we all need that encouragement and uh, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I remember being on a flight to Rome and I was sat in, my expenses were being paid and I was sat in, the, is it business class? You know, I was sat in the privileged seats and next to me were two of the most beautiful women in saris, young, probably in their 20s, absolutely gorgeous women, these two women. And, you know, our food was served on our laps, and we got me and this one next to me got talking. And she said to me, um, why, are you, why are you going to Rome, you know? I said, well, I um, said, I'm... Um, I'm d doing some, uh, I'm working, um, and I, I was like really stumbling over my words. And it, I think it, I think it was about doing this opera or sets or something, I don't know. Or it could have been I was having an exhibition. I can't remember what it was, but it was certainly either the exhibition I had or I was, I was doing this bloody opera. And she said, oh, wow. She turns to me and looks at me and she's like, you know, she's absolutely she's dripping in gold jewellery as well and piercings and the red, you know, the, in the forehead. And she said, you're an artist. And I went, nah, nah. I felt so embarrassed to be called an artist. I think it's to do with class. Someone else was talking about that on Instagram recently. And I think it's to do with class, you know. I... I uh, I, I go back to when, you know, I was a kid and saying I want to be a commercial artist because I knew I couldn't be an artist. And um, I think my work, you know, I've been told by that bloke in the gallery I'm a cartoonist. And yet you get told by other people, you know, like, I do cartoons or whatever. Oh, you're an artist. So uh, it's up for other people to decide, not me. I, I could never, I can't call myself, in all seriousness, I cannot call myself an artist. But if people want to call me that, yeah, I'll take it. But um, artists usually are either dead in my books. or That's what I used to think. You can only be an artist if you were dead, <laughs> if you were Van Gogh or Rembrandt or something. I didn't realise. That's when I was about 16, 17. I, I seriously thought, you know, all artists were dead. I didn't realise they were contemporary people living and breathing and doing art when I was 16. But um, now I think, yeah, unless you're, you know, a conceptual artist, forget it. I'm not an art, you know, artist or conceptual artist these days. You're either, you know... Um, you know, these people who uh, get their heads um, um, done in blood or um, cast in blood or, you know, they have a light switch going on and off or they're Damien Hurst or they're, you know, no, I'm not bitter or anything or Tracy Emin, you know, these sort of people or Sarah Lucas or, you know, they're artists, not me. But I, I, I'm not envious. So. I wish I earned their money. <laughs>